One, two. Hello, everyone. Hi, and uh, welcome to Berlin Music Week. Uh, we've got one of the first uh, sessions uh, going live today, and thanks so much for coming down. Uh, this is uh, a live recording of uh, uh, Digital Music Trends, uh, the podcast. I don't know if you have uh, listened to it before. I've got a t-shirt today. I don't usually have a t-shirt, but that's, uh, I thought I'd make the effort today. And uh, I uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the session. We're going to talk about uh, some of the topical news of the past week uh, here uh, at the happening the music tech space uh, with some fantastic guests. And uh, we're also going to cover some of the uh, some key hot topics that are going to be covered here at the conference uh, at Berlin Music Week. Uh, and uh, so I'll just do a quick intro for my show as I usually do it, and then we'll launch straight into it. Hello everyone, and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, recorded live from Berlin Music Week. Uh, thanks for coming to the session today, and if you've never come across the show before, uh, go check out digitalmusictrends.com. I'm Andrea Linelli, and I produce podcasts covering the latest news and the most interesting uh, companies in the music tech industry. And uh, the shows have been running since 2009, uh, with uh, hundreds of guests uh, to date. Uh, and uh, I'm joined today, actually, by four new guests that have never been on the show before, so that's super exciting, and thanks so much for uh, joining me today. And we start with uh, Janine uh, Wilker from uh, Fine Tunes, and uh, Janine, I wanted to ask you briefly uh, what, uh, what you do with Fine Tunes and what Fine Tunes is about in about 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, 30 seconds, starting now. Fine Tunes is a digital distributor from the independent um, world, and um, we are uh, working with about like, 3,500 labels internationally right now, um, covering all digital distribution services, and my job is the strategic marketing, so I'm there for creating strategic cooperations with magazines, media partners, and as well I'm covering the sales marketing for the French market. Great. It's great to have you. And uh, second, we have uh, Benjamin Lebrave. Le 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 Am I pronouncing correctly? Lebrave, Lebrave. Either one, either, either one works. <laughs> Founder of uh, Aquaba Music, a streamlined platform for distribution and promotion of African music content. So how, how did that start out? Um, I came to realize about seven years ago that music released, recorded and released in most countries in Africa is really difficult to get a hand of um, if you're not there. So I tried to fill that gap and seven years later I'm still doing it. So what that means is I'm based in Accra, Ghana. I travel whenever I can to different parts of the continent. Um, and I try to work with artists to put out their music internationally, mostly, on mostly online, working with companies like Fine Tunes and promoting it, making sure it's on the radio, helping them get tours, and you know, doing what most artists do everywhere in the world. Awesome. And uh, we have a Fiona Alpuma on the show, which is uh, great to meet you. We're actually fellow Londoners, but we never met before. So that's, it's uh, crazy, isn't kind of it? It's crazy, right? <laughs> and uh, Fiona, you run uh, a great site on uh, African pop music, uh, and uh, it's called Afripop, and also do a bunch of different other things. You work with Social Media Week in South African uh, freelance journalists as well. So. Uh, well, yeah, I do a lot of things, don't I? <laughs> yeah, so um, I, at, at uh, AfriPop magazine, which is, as the name implies, it's a global popular culture, well, global African music and popular culture site. Um, we started it, myself and uh, my partner Yolanda, she's based in New York, and I'm based in London some of the time. Um, and so we got together and we just thought, you know, we were looking online and we never really saw um, magazines that reflected the reality of being uh, an African person in all these big cosmopolitan spaces, places like New York, like London, like Berlin, you know, just no places that were fun and just kind of reflecting what we were doing in fashion, in film, in music. So we just decided to start a blog between the two of us. And then since then, we've kind of grown to a team of about eight wow. contributors uh, yeah, from the continent and in the diaspora. That's great. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Michael Krause from Deezer. So hi, Michael. And uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Deezer? Yeah, of course. So I co-founded uh, the German streaming service Empire, uh, which we merged together with Deezer actually this week. Um, so yeah, very exciting times. Uh, Deezer is the uh, largest uh, music streaming provider, music streaming service uh, in terms of paid music streaming when it comes to coverage. So we're in 180 countries. Um, we have the largest catalog and uh, in terms of subscribers also are the second largest. Um, and I'm heading up the GSA team, so uh, the German speaking territories. Austria. 
Don't forget Austria. For those that are home and uh, my home to know what GSA is. And uh, so I want to start today by talking about some of the figures that have transpired in the past few weeks uh, and when it comes to recorded music sales in the first half of 2014. So in the USA, we've seen the lowest uh, recorded music uh, record, uh, album sales uh, to date. Uh, so unfortunately, we've seen a uh, uh, Nielsen Sounds kind of released the figures uh, in the past few days uh, talking about that and they said that it's the first time ever that album sales fell below the 4 million units uh, sold in a week uh, number. Uh, so this unfortunately feels like a bit more of a pattern than just a little blip. Uh, and uh, for example, the first eight weeks of Q3, uh, of the third quarter of 2014, uh, the sales in the USA have, been, uh, have seen a weekly average decrease by half a million units over the first quarter of last year. So a pretty uh, broad uh, decrease in sales uh, across the board there. And uh, uh, so, you know, first of all, uh, we are seeing this decline in the USA, which is kind of broadly related to uh, the advent of streaming, and, uh, you know, people are correlating a few different things here. Uh, but at the same time, in Germany, for example, we've seen uh, similar figures come out uh, uh, about the first half of 2014, but they're much better in the sense that it's only a minus 0.8 decline. Uh, the CD sales have only uh, declined about 3%, 3.6% uh, compared to last year. And, uh, it, you know, the physical market is still so strong, all, all those, you know, streaming, of course, is growing, so it grew 77%, uh, I believe. And uh, uh, so, taking these two completely different markets, uh, uh, Michael, let me start, let's start with you, too, coming from Deezer. Are we, are we looking here at different markets that are struggling through a transition, but may eventually end up in the same place? You know, for example, we see the Nordic countries are being heralded as an example in this case, although some people argue that it's a very different situation. So what are your thoughts and how do you think these different, very different uh, markets will evolve? Yeah, I mean, um, actually I think that, uh, of course, I have to say that, but I strongly believe in that personally, that music streaming will be the uh, dominant uh, way to consume music in the next uh, years, depending on the country. There are certain stages of involvement, how far the countries are. Uh, and in these certain stages of evolvement of those countries, you see certain drops and then uh, growing numbers in, in uh, recorded music. Um, so, of course, if the, if the uh, download area kicked in, then the recorded music in terms of CD sales usually went down a bit because people were able to choose and not have to buy whole albums again to get the single they like and so on. Um, with music streaming, you probably have a, have a same or a different factor that um, especially the strong music listeners and so the strong music buyers as well use streaming first, so there might be a first like short drop in the, in the numbers. Uh, but once you turn music streaming, and that's actually um, our vision and, and our, our mission as well, to turn streaming into mainstreaming, <laughs> um, then, then you will see rising numbers again, um, because I mean, a music streaming customer who uses a premium product, um, yeah, they, they usually invest about 120 euros uh, in, in Europe, for example. Um, so, so that's a lot compared to the average um, uh, figures that a, that a download or CD buyer would, would have spent in a year. Um, so if we can turn all those customers into music streaming lovers, uh, which we do, hopefully, um, then, then the market will, will uh, benefit from that for sure. Yeah. Uh, Janine, uh, I want to ask you about this uh, sort of double uh, dip that we had. In a sense, you know, first we have the dip uh, you know, due to piracy and all sorts of different things and people moving to digital. Uh, and the kind of digital sales. At one point, it felt like a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, revenues were starting to increase again, and it, it felt like downloads were catching up to the decline in sales. And now, because the streaming is becoming so prevalent, uh, we're seeing another blip because, of course, the industry is catching up again to this new medium. So, uh, from a financial perspective, having this sort of overall perspective on how things are evolving in the marketplace, uh, how do you see this uh, moving forward? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's exactly like that. We are seeing this this more kind of less um, second blip. Um, people are transitioning, definitely. Uh, technically, it's 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 there. I mean, streaming is there, and it's a wonderful opportunity to use as much music as you want. It's easy. Uh, you don't have to store any files on your computer, and when you do not have a computer or a device, you can't listen to it. So um, it makes it a great experience, and fortunately for our customers, we are, we are seeing that downloads are more or less stable, yep. even if we, we are finding, I mean, even in France, there is like a 10% dip uh, when it comes to digital downloads, streaming is on the rise, definitely. But 
for us, it's right now, um, the task is not too much to um, educate labels about streaming and that they sh need to be on there, but um, the thing for us is to really find different strategies for different genres and niche genres to cope with this transition. Because, I mean, for a jazz label, it's pretty hard to cope with the streaming factor because they really have to, um, yeah, to tear their fans to the platform and make them listen to the stuff over and over again. And this, is, uh, this feels kind of hard. So for us, the task right now is to really get away from this single product album thing, one album a year, promote that, and then hopefully that will sell and bring the success for, for the artist, but to really find proper marketing strategies and marketing plans, and we are doing that a lot. I mean, we are more, kind of less, since 11 years, we are in the market and we are creating a lot of planning, um, strategies, timelines, and different product um, packagings to cope with these transitions. And I think this is the big task to have a kind of pool of material from an artist or a label and then make it work on the different platforms, not only business model wise, but also on the different streaming platforms. Like make it work on Deezer, make it work on Spotify, make it work on Wimp. And this means that it's not the same streaming product, but even the streaming product is a different one yeah. in any case. So for us, it's really, we're seeing that the market is it's getting more and more atomized in a way, and we have to put a lot more effort in it, but with the right strategy, we are hoping and we are pretty optimistic to, to offer really um, successful solutions to almost every label from every genre. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, uh, the African market is incredibly interesting because there's so much, uh, it's so different. You know, just as a transition, one thing that I'll mention about streaming, because I find it very interesting. The music, so I promote music, let's, let's just make it simple. I live in Ghana, let's just focus on Ghanaian music. So I work with top Ghanaian artists, and I make, put their music on Deezer, iTunes, etc. cetera. Um, when I started five years ago, iTunes was maybe 80 or 85% of the dis digital revenue. Now it's probably about a third. And the combination of Deezer, Spotify, and YouTube is enormous, and I think that has to do with the fact that, in a way, the music, even though for some people what I promote is very niche, it's also very much mainstream, very pop-driven, very hits-driven. So it's kind of immediate music, and people want it right now, and they may want it you know, 50 times a day, and even though they may not buy it, they're still consuming. So I think that's interesting. But now, in Ghana, so the industry in Ghana is actually very different, but there was a market. Maybe it's particular to Ghana and a handful of other countries, but there's been a recording industry. There were big, big CD sales. I, I couldn't quote you numbers, but I know that you used to see CD shops everywhere, and there was major distributors. And at the time, I met some of the distributors, and you know they have big cars and big offices, and it was an industry. It collapsed entirely, and it wasn't a matter of percentage points per quarter. It just collapsed. It's gone entirely. What's really interesting, though, is people have entirely moved on, and no one regrets it. Some people who still want to you know, distribute items, now they distribute cell phones or SIM cards or whatever, so they're still doing that. But in terms of music, it's now entirely digital. And in a way, it feels kind of post-distribution because no one's even trying to make money from distribution. It's strictly shows or endorsements. And I think probably Fiona could um, tell us more about that, but I think um, in, in most countries now, it's all about endorsements. I know there's, I know Deezer is coming to, to Ghana in a, few, in a few weeks, and I know it's expanding in Africa. I, I don't know how effective it'll be. I don't know because the amount of people who have a phone which can stream and people who want to download or who want to listen on a phone, I mean, everyone has a phone, but not everyone, I think, would be in a position to buy a service, a streaming service, because you need a you know, more high-tech phone, etc. So I don't know. I really don't know how big it'll be. Um, but certainly, I feel in some ways the industry is absolutely thriving. So it's interesting. Um, I feel like it's very early days as far as streaming as the 
there's absolutely no comparison between what is happening in Europe and in America and what is happening in in Africa. And I'll speak, for example, in South Africa, um, there is there is a big scramble. You know, uh, Deezer is there now. Spotify, I think, is headed there. Uh, Simfy is there. So all of them are headed there. But I think everyone is still really just trying to figure it out because, um, you know, things like broadband penetration is very low in Africa. Streaming costs are still extremely high. So, you know, for those kinds of companies to make it in Africa, they're just going to need to figure out a different model. I think the service providers are going to have to come in with a different way to charge people for yeah. data and for things like that in order for it to be a success. Um, and like, uh, like Benjamin said, it's very much about the endorsement deal for uh, a lot of the African artists. I, for one, I mean, in South Africa, yes, there was a time when, you know, your biggest selling artist would sell 100,000 copies. That's a big number for, for, um, for the industry. And that's for, you know, as you, you know this as well, like piracy is quite rife in, in, in Africa. Um, and so, yeah, so it does feel like in a way, the streaming and the, and the mobile phone options are a little bit more, they address the issue of piracy more than what used to happen with CDs. Because I feel like there, in as much as artists sold, there was a lot more that they could have made um, in sales and, and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I love how we managed to go from talking about declining album sales in the yes. US to talking about music in Ghana here. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Yeah. And uh, so we're going to talk about one of the hot topics uh, here at World of Music Week, actually. It's quite a good segue uh, to talk about the discoverability. And so uh, more than I want to talk about discovery from the user perspective, because I'm sure everybody probably read and heard so much about that, but I want to talk about discoverability from the perspective of the artists. And so, uh, you know, with millions of new tracks coming out every day, editorial, you know, the room on services is very scant uh, at the moment. Uh, and we're not there yet in terms of, you know, services really being able to successfully recommend niche artists to niche audiences and identifying those kind of things. So, uh, maybe starting with you, you know, you were talking about the fact that you still have big hits, but of course catering to a very specific market. So how do you push them through in, in, in services like Spotify, for example, or these are? The honest answer would be, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll try to give you more. Um, it's a struggle. I mean, every day I ask myself, and I've been doing it now for five years, and it, with every, I put out about 50 releases. With F every release, I ask myself, who am I going to target? Who's interested in this? Um, so it's a matter of identifying blogs like AfriPop, um, being patient, uh, being thorough, and insisting, and little by little, it comes. I mean, I think it, it, maybe there's other ways to do it. In my case, I've done it by hand. I don't hire PR companies. It takes time, but eventually, I feel once you actually do identify an audience or even just a blog, there could be a really strong connection because once people say, like, ah, okay, so what you send me makes sense, fine, and then you have this privileged relationship. But I haven't found any miracle solution. For me, it's work. And that's the thing that I was to say because you know, some people you know, are perceiving services as the, you know, the, the start and end point of, of a journey for listeners, while you know, what you're saying is that listeners actually find out about music elsewhere, and then using the services as a tool to consume the music is, is quite a different thing. So if you're having an intro experience, uh, you know, of course, the, the usual hustle and bustle of scrolling on services and spending all these ridiculous dollars on mm -hmm. the new releases on the streaming wars and things like that. Uh, but aside from that, what are the tools that are Yeah, the funny thing is, uh, to a certain extent, I completely agree with Benjamin here, because there is no template you could simply use, and if you're using that, and if you're sticking to this and that specific timeline and communication plan, then it will work. So this is exactly what I meant by, we are trying to invest the time to check with every licensor, with every label, for the highlight releases, what can we do around this release, and timing is a crucial point here, because I mean, um, when you look at h when you need to start to plan campaigns and plan strategies, so what you're gonna do, then half a year is not is nothing, pretty much. So what we are doing, we are trying on a very, very early stage to have a very close relationship with our labels and um, learn more about the artist, diving really into the product, into the music, and um, yeah, seeing exactly those quest questions like where's my target group, where are my fans, does it make sense to have 
uh, a crowdfunding campaign, whatever. Or where should I go on tour? Where are like multiplicators in the market, blog-wise, magazine-wise, um, radio-wise? Are there any contacts I can use? Um, what's there? What's in there for promotion and marketing? And so we are really specific on then collecting all that kind of info and trying to give it a boost with the templates and the tools we are having yeah. with different platforms. And I mean, there is a lot of discussion that, you know, streaming, it pays nothing. And you, of course, you can't make a living with it and all that kind of stuff. But um, our experience is that this is right now at the moment for certain artists and genres, it's definitely still true, unfortunately. Yeah. But... Um, we have many labels who just dived into the possibilities and they really try to use every tool which is offered by the platforms and there are a lot of things you can do on streaming platforms and yeah. um, so and it's it's really about the combination it's it's your success will not be defined by how am I presented in a playlist of Spotify or of Deezer this yeah. is this is just one single part of the game and this is what I meant with that labels, I mean, nowadays labels, they have so many jobs to do. <laughs> it's, it's really like, it's a complete business. And then you have the whole creative part, which of course needs to be covered and wants to be covered. So we're trying to be a partner who invests a lot of time, first of all, and then also tries to think about advances and where we can help. Yeah. But it's really about time diving in the music so we we are not and that's the funny part it's not this business anymore where you just get copies of music you see oh well it's uh, <laughs> pop oh it sells it sells yeah so you really have to work with the music again maybe that's a kind of aspect which is a good thing although right now it's a pretty shaky situation in the market sure. Sure, but sure. It's about the right partners, it's about working with the release, it's about the timing, and it's about the proper strategies, and yeah. trying to find these little things tiny things to, things to, work to with. make it work. Absolutely. And it takes a lot of time. I mean, Absolutely. You start with a promotion at the beginning of the year, and in December you're still talking with platforms, so we're yeah. not having this this small product life cycle or promotion, and when the promotion is through, we are forgetting about the release. Yeah, so yeah. it's really... And in a sense like, uh, sorry, in a sense like Michael, uh, uh, do you, do you find that, uh, of course, you're doing a lot of work on the editorial point of view, but do you find that the editorial space, in a sense, or you know, the, the space on the front page of Deezer is almost working a bit like uh, you know, the old physical retail stores, where you, essentially it's kind of pre-booked in advance, in a sense, because you know about releases now? I mean, that's a very thankful question for us, actually, because Deezer works in a way that we have editors in all the countries, uh, yeah. in most of the countries. Um, so we have a combination uh, of algorithms who will propose to you automatically what you like on Facebook, what you listen to, and so on. So the, uh, the techie part. But then you have the human factor, like really editors looking at certain clusters. So not what's in the charts all the time, but looking at clusters, for example, those three customers who listen to those four jazz music arti artists. So then Janine comes along with a new jazz music artist that's the same, then they will have that in their feeds. So not like what's in the charts, but really what uh, the editors pick for that kind of cluster. And looking for opportunities within, within Deezer to promote artists, um, there, are, there are many things. Uh, first of all, we have a great CRM, pro, uh, um, great, uh, CRM possibilities. So we can target via email or in the feed um, on a, on a very detailed level, like for example, you yeah. can send an email to all those customers who listen to those three tracks. If you think that the new track or the new album that's coming out is matching that. Um, or other like things that, that are not used so often but are very, very effective um, are playlists. So if your artist creates a playlist of the songs he likes best, um, then you will get a, a lot of visibility um, and you can also promote, if, if you also like then integrate songs from, from your label, you can also promote new artists or those, those artists, like those famous artists can promote um, and endorse actually the, the younger and, and new artists. Yeah. So I, I, I can like continue for half an hour to explain <laughs> there's so many possibilities. <laughs> yes, so absolutely. I, I encourage labels and, and, uh, and also even, even artist management to just look at, at the possibilities and, and then work with that because there's so many possibilities that is not about the charts, it's not about the, the physical sales charts. Yeah. Uh, Fiona, you talk to artists uh, probably on a daily basis. How are they looking at the uh, streaming services? Are, are they looking at you as the place that is going to help them reach the audience and then the audience is just going to go to the streaming service by default? Or are they actually, you know, uh, 
concerned about their positioning on the platforms themselves. So just to, just to add on, on Michael's point about the human <coughs> factor, I think you can't emphasize that part of promotion um, enough. So for example, I, I do a playlist for a service called 22 Tracks. I don't know if you guys yeah. know it. Um, and what it does is essentially it picks the tastemakers in different scenes and it gets them to select what's hot. And what I specifically do is I do a mix of what's hot in terms of the charts, but also what's hot in terms of what's coming up. So I think a very useful strategy for, um, for labels, for artists, is to actually make sure you know the people who are the influencers in, in the culture. I think that, I think word of mouth is one of the more kind of organic and the more believable ways that the music can grow. And then, um, so our artists coming to, to us to break their music all the time, all the time. And I think that, you know, you have to, you can't play everybody. We do a f what we call a filtering service. So what we put on Afripop is what we think is the best or what deserves an, an ear. Um, others, art, other sites do everything. They'll put everything on and you kind of just hope for the best and get on there. But we kind of position ourselves as curators so that when labels come to us, they know exactly what the service is that we can offer them and artists and, and everyone else. Yeah. And I wanted to take, uh, sort of jump onto a new story, but sort of stay in, on a similar theme because uh, uh, yesterday, for example, uh, CD Baby announced uh, the release of a CD Baby free service where uh, artists can go and, and upload their music uh, for free, essentially, to all the different services, but they're going to give a 15% commission on the sales to CD Baby, which is higher than what they would usually charge. So. Uh, I was interested in this sort of vein because it, that's not the only company that's done something like this. There's other companies that have uh, sort of uh, uh, done free distribution deals. Uh, and it's interesting because it lowers the barriers of access in an interesting way for countries, certain countries in Africa, for example, where a $50 upfront fee would not be feasible for people to, to, to be able to pay or you know, even, even just access to credit cards is, is restricted and so uh, people wouldn't be able to just pay by credit card for distributing their music on, on, on a worldwide basis. So uh, Benjamin, do you think that might have an effect, uh, this lowering of the barriers for worldwide distribution on who releases what and maybe uh, open access to more people to, 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 to more markets? I can't help but wear my label hats and say probably it'll just crowd the market with even more crap that I wish were not in the stores. But right. with that said, maybe there's some good stuff. Uh, but in the case of Africa, I think the difficulty you said is more the credit cards than the money. There's maybe this misconception that artists in Africa are broke and that it's not true. The money they invest, even a small time artist, the money they invest in studio time, etc., in radio, payola, all that stuff is huge. The problem is in certain countries, like in Ghana, you it's difficult to have access to an international visa card. You cannot get PayPal, you can't, just period. Uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and some other countries, Cote d'Ivoire, you can't. So there becomes this kind of ridiculous threshold, which is that you must work with a foreign entity just to have the financial link, which seems totally unfair, but that's how it is. Um, but more broadly, uh, so yeah, so I think in the case I think a lot of, in the case of Ghana, a lot of the music is already up in the, in the stores. Um, I don't know if this would, I think the only thing it would, it would do is then artists would come up to me and say, hey, why are you, you know, doing it this way when I can do it myself? And it'll be hard for me to justify that. <laughs> it's fine to have your music in iTunes, but if no one else is pushing it, exactly. iTunes yeah. and Deezer, et cetera, if no one's pushing it, it's absolutely pointless. And then it makes, and as I started saying, I think then it makes our jobs more difficult because we're trying to yeah. push what we think is relevant content. And, you know, um, there's just more, more, more uh, go ahead. gray matter out there. Just to add on to what Benjamin is saying, online, and, you know, I'm, I'm very, you know, hands-on in terms of online promotion and stuff, but in Africa, and I'm speaking of Africa in a homogenous Pan-African sense, even though the markets are different from region to region, but traditional media still plays a very big part in how music is promoted, how it's distributed. So MTV and Channel O and Trace TV, you know, the big music channels are a big part of kind of carrying the music down the distribution line, the promotion and stuff. So you can't ignore that. Sorry about that. You can't really ignore that part of, in as much as you can employ an online or a digital strategy, you must be aware that that is, 
you still need radio, you still need TV, you need all of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I sort of, I'm going to fuse two stories together here because uh, uh, time is running very quickly. I'm like, whoa, it's the time already. So uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, uh, the uh, release of uh, uh, a new feature by... Um, uh, this is my jam, which is a startup based in London, uh, which came out uh, of the Econest. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the Econest, this is my jam is essentially a service that uh, uh, allows users to pick one song that they want to listen to, uh, you know, that, that is their favorite track for that day or that week or that month, and essentially that allows them to build a history of uh, uh, all the tracks that they've favorited over, over the last few years. I don't know if anybody's used this is my jam here before. No. No. Okay, so uh, they've released uh, a, essentially a catalog of the half a million tracks that uh, were favorited by somebody somewhere at some point on the service. And for them, this is sort of like a, a, a distillation of the millions and millions of tracks that are available on services like Deezer uh, and a way for people to navigate that catalog a little bit better, perhaps you know, by providing also some genre classification in the future and playlisting and stuff. So, uh, Michael, uh, we're talking about you know, CD Baby, the fact that there might be even more artists coming on board because they don't even need to put the money up front to pull the release up. And at, on the other hand, seeing a service like This Is My Jam creating a half a million tracks, this is what you need to listen to because people have chosen it as their track for a particular moment. How do you see those two things coming together and how do you feel it is going to come together on Deezer? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I believe strongly in the kind of democratic approach to music. So whoever produces music should have the right to have an audience for that, if it's through live shows or if it's through Deezer. Um, actually, uh, we don't judge what's crap and what's not crap. And if someone finds an audience for, for, for the, these songs and promotes it by himself, uh, I, we, we're happy. Uh, if, if music makes people happy, we're happy. Um, so so we, we, are, we are open to all these kind of initiatives like CD Baby and so on. Um, in, in terms of those highlighting songs, I, this is a, also a social approach, right? So what you like on Facebook, it will, it will show up there. Um, I, I, have a, I have a bit... Um, Different, different view on that. So I think music is very personal as well to a certain extent. So I don't want to all, all the time post on Facebook or show whatever I'm listening because sometimes it's really intimate and, and very, very personal. And I won't have the, the possibility, of course, to share with my friends. And, and these are, for example, opening a lot of possibilities to, to also follow your friends and so on. But you can always select what you want to share. And I guess that's, that's very important. And, and if that new initiative is something where you, you openly share things that you like and other people can follow that and, and listen to that, I think it's a nice idea, um, but I, I'm not into all these things where automatic sharing. No, that's no, that's very much. You have to go on the site and you have to choose a track. You don't, it, it's not done automatically. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I saw it. So yeah, it's 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 okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> that, yeah. People can like uh, songs and so on, on on Deezer as well, and they have yeah. all the variety of the 30 uh, million songs. So so I rather go there, but it's it's up to everyone to decide where they consume the music. So um, yeah, and of course it's all uh, available on APIs. So I guess of course yeah, you can, can also can be we are the hackathon tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> all the 30 million tracks are available. So where anyone has a good idea, like like any startup, we're open to cooperate and yeah, and also have all these in apps where in the service we'll also feature it. Yeah, uh, Janine, uh, let's pick up on on this conversation around sort of a mass of music here and sort of more curated, uh, restricted catalog here. O you know, how, how do you see this uh, evolving, this uh, sort of uh, tension between uh, a huge marketplace and a much smaller one? Yeah, I mean, combining these two worlds in a way is a part of our job. I find yeah. it kind of funny that everyone is seeing this new CD Baby thing as cheap, because it isn't. Yeah. I mean, ask a proper digital distributor about his contracts and all the ones, I mean, all the ones I know in the German market, whether it's Quantum New Media, whether it's Belief, whether it's Zebralution, whether it's Fine Tunes, it's not about 50-50 share, it's about 80-20 share. And you don't have a very, very small, like, three euros or even less setup fee for a release. And the best is you're getting the sales marketing for free. Hooray. So why not ask... Um, distributors who are out there and yeah, yeah they might seem big and international firms but we are really listening to every submission we are getting um, we have labels that have two albums out since five years we have labels with a catalog of over like 5,000 releases and it's not about catalog size it's not about genres it's about the music it's about how passionate someone is if he wants to work on his stuff then we are up for trying to see what we can do to support that in 
whichever way, which also um, is um, recommendations. I mean, yeah. I totally agree um, with you that the thing is very personal. So my recommendations, for example, um, are coming from my favorite record store where I'm buying my vinyls. It's coming from Accelerator or 22 Tracks. It's coming from Giles Peterson websites. It's coming from uh, Hypebot or Hype Track. It's coming from magazines and online blogs. And there is not the one way to discover music. I mean, you're talking yeah. with your friends about something. For me, still, recommendation algorithms like Spotify, they're not going to work until now because I'm a huge jazz fan. And if I'm listening to Freddie Hubbard and then he's, the services are telling me, well, why not check out the new album by Freddie Hubbard? And you know there is no new album since, yeah. obviously. So this is still shaky. So I love to ask um, someone in, in person or I check out a blog, the jazz thing blog or whatever. Sure. So what I or want to say is that it's a combination of many different things where you get your recommendations from. And if this this is my jam works to a certain extent, to a certain part, and afterwards you maybe go on Deezer and create your own playlist because you yeah. really like what you have heard there, why not? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we'll see. And I've, I think, uh, you know, we're running out of time, unfortunately, already. But uh, one thing that I want to touch upon was uh, talking about transparency. So I think if there's any artists in the room here, uh, you'll probably be aware of uh, all the issues that have been around in the last uh, sort of 18 to 24 months around uh, transparency and fairness in digital music. So we've heard complaints on the, from the independent community over YouTube's ta tactics in the licensing. We talked about the question marks around whether some, some of the value generated by digital music services is locked in by majors before the pie is shared with independents. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Merlin had uh, spoken about this a few months back. Uh, uh, and you know, we also talked about how reporting is still a big issue. I don't know if there's any labels, labels in the room, but uh, you know, the, the microtransactional aspect of streaming means that the reports are still huge very difficult to ingest and very difficult to audit as well in a sense so uh, you know I think this is going to progress thanks to the progress pro progress of technology hopefully uh, but Michael wh what is your take and, and you know so how are you working with for example smaller labels to make the information a bit more uh, digestible um, I mean, in general, I can say that um, that I'm very confident that Deezer is not only pushing chart music, which is always uh, one criticism that, that the smaller artists are getting less because the major part of the of the cake is going through these chart musicians. Um, so, so we really uh, we also have this Young Guns app where we even support totally unknown artists and, and push them. Um, and we have this recommendation, as I as I um, as I explained, and the flow functionality a feature where you can just listen to new stuff all the time. So there's all these newcomers in. So we really push uh, also unknown artists or, or smaller artists. So, so that's that can't be. <laughs> Um, uh, th this can't be the case uh, for, for these at least. Um, in terms of technology, of course, it's, it's a huge catalog and, and there are a lot of plays, especially if you go in 180 countries like we are. Of course, the reports going to fine tunes can be a, a bit larger. Um, but it's all like, it's, it's on the other side, it's still very simple, right? It's, it's, like <laughs> it's like the plays you have per artist and then you get your, your label pool share. Um, so, so I think it's, it's more or less take some time to, to become market standard for those new reports. It also was a big hassle when the download business started uh, and there were new uh, XML formats coming in and, and uh, new ways to distribute. So, so technology is of course evolving with the technology of distribution evolving, so technology of reporting. Um, and everyone has to adapt and if they are not able to do so, I mean they are very good and, and, and easy available uh, partners or service providers who could easily help on that. So I, yeah. I, and that's, that's not like, ruining all the margin because the, the, the business model is adapted already. So I don't think this is really the issue of the industry. Right. Um, and then the one, thing, one thing that has always been like a big discussion is how much our labels or distributors are paying out to the artists. We of had course, some yeah. discussion on that. So um, of course that's not in our hand as a streaming provider, um, but of course their, their transparency will probably help to, to be more fair there in some cases. Um, but as we see like 80, 20 sounds like, a, like also a great deal. So. Um, yeah. I don't think uh, that over the long run uh, it will be an issue. It's probably yeah. more transition thing. 
Yeah, and I, I guess we have uh, only a few minutes, but uh, quickly, Janine, on, on your front, uh, how are you dealing with uh, having to get reports from everybody uh, in a different way, everything, you know, millions of different streams, uh, uh, you know, trying to figure out whether people are paying you correctly. Uh, is that an issue for you or not at this point? Or have you developed the technology necessary to, to keep track of everything? I know, um, I mean, um, when you started with um, saying the term YouTube, I mean, we have to differentiate between the standard accounting, which is um, going on every day, and the negotiations about political and legal things. So, of course, yeah. But when it comes to accountability, um, for us, it's not a problem when the metadata is properly done, which is the, this is, I mean, metadata are the crown jewels of the industry still, and they will always be. So when we have a proper set of metadata, it's, almost no problem with all of the standard legal big stores to have proper reportings you could easily sort. So we have different importers, different XML interfaces, importers for every shop, which is checked and created uh, when the shop is um, within the fine tunes network and it's constantly updated. So for us, this transparency um, subject is a very important one because yep. we are coming from a strict independent background and it, it has always been our goal to um, provide the best statements and the, in the fastest way. I mean, we are doing monthly statements and yeah. payments um, to the artists. And if there are issues, we have a quality management system, quality assurance in the different departments, whether it's accounting, whether it's tech, uh, digital logistics, or whether it's the product management. So, of course, this is constantly evolving. And um, the funny thing is, w when you see, when you look um, at companies like RL RLV, this uh, accounting software, which is then working on the labels end yeah. to make the data more accessible and sortable and analyzable for one man label uh, with having certain startups in that e area of back office solutions for labels. That will help. That Absolutely. will help. So I uh, don't think there's a problem. Uh, Benjamin, for you, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, your, own, you know, your own label. And so uh, have you f encountered problems in figuring out or even just opening up reports when you get them or, or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, the reports are, as you said, tedious to look into. One thing I wish I had access to, and it's a question I can ask to both of you, um, in this world where we're always talking about issues with privacy and how every user is tracked and how we can determine patterns and what everyone does, when it comes to music services, I, as a label guy, get absolutely nothing. I can see what streams on each platform, fine, I can see how many downloads, but I have no idea if I get repeat users, I have no idea about specific territories. There's a lot of, I mean specific, I can know nationally, I don't know per city, I can't say, oh this guy is, you know, if I look at the numbers in France, I have no idea if I get, let's say, a million streams of a certain song, is it, how many people are actually streaming it? Which cities are they in? Are they in Paris? Are they all over the country? There's a lot of stuff that I'm sure provide the, the, the services have access to, which we labels still don't have access to. I'm sure it's a lot of work on the distributor side, on your side, but I'm kind of wondering when, when is it going to be available? Since that's something that I have access to directly with SoundCloud, with Bandcamp, with every other service that I deal with directly. So I'm not paid by a service like SoundCloud, but the amount of information I can get from it, for me, is priceless. And it helps me determine a lot of the strategy of the label and where I'm going to push the artists. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, I guess you, you might have actually more data on who visits the blog from where for a certain artists and actually know a little bit more about the fans in, in a strange way. Um, yeah, I, but I think it's it's different things that I'm looking for compared to what he needs. You know, I just I have got Google Analytics, which breaks down every single thing that I need. So you know, I don't know. And have you ever heard from an artist that wanted to to ask you? You know, if if a blog gets up or a review gets particular heat, has anybody ever asked you a breakdown of where the the views are coming no, from? No, no. Surprisingly, nobody ever asked that kind of data. It's always just you know, it the the interaction just ends with. Can you play my song? <laughs> That's, That's interesting because, yeah. like, I guess if the one person came, you might actually be able to give them the data pretty easily. That's so. right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Blogs would have that. That's interesting. I mean, I know. I mean, I, I also have analytics on my own site, and I could ask blogs individually. But in terms of trends for sales or for yeah, actually paying yeah. services, oh, I, know what you mean. I have no idea. You know, and I could ask Fiona which you know if there's a link to iTunes, what kind of you know how many users go there, etc. But still the it's very, it's, it's one dot in an ocean. 
Yeah, I, I mean, Pandora has been promising a service that will break down uh, where people are playing music for, for years now. Hopefully, that's coming fairly soon. Uh, I know, you know, these are working so much on the data that I, I, wouldn't, I would imagine something like that is, is probably in the works. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, first of all, a very good sign that you're interested in those data because it seems that you're like <laughs> data data driven, and that's probably the way to go on, on streaming services as well. Uh, so actually, of course, we we have a lot of data. Some are personal data, which we of course can't can't give away. We're very very uh, strict on on the, the personality of the data, but there's of course data that can be shared, which is kind of then then neutral. Um, and we're always always happy to to discuss with uh, with labels to see okay, what can we take out of the data? What can we learn together out of that? Uh, and how how does it help to, for example, create new campaigns and so on? So we work very data-driven and happy to share that. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's fantastic. And uh, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about, I guess, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about startups. And uh, uh, you know, we have people from different backgrounds here, and uh, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. You know, we're here in Berlin, uh, one of the European startup hubs, uh, uh, you know, home of SoundCloud and a bunch of other services. Uh, you know, Ableton started here as, as a startup, uh, essentially, uh, although it's not a startup anymore. And, uh, you know, these are, I guess, is not it's technically a startup anymore. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's got quite a few hundred employees. Uh, but, you know, how are you seeing, uh, first, in your respective cities and uh, perhaps in the region that you're in, the evolution of the startup community when it comes to music? Is there a community? Are people interested in tech and music? And, and if so, what are they doing about it? So maybe, uh, Fiona, if you want to start, because you might have a good overview of what's going on in London as opposed to what's going on in some of the territories that you work with uh, in, in Africa as well. Um, well, I can mention specific startups that I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in, in how they're evolving. And um, two of them, the ones that I, I quite like, are from Kenya. Um, I don't know if you know much about what's happening in, in the Kenyan tech scene, but no, it's, it's pretty much a leader in what's happening for technology in Africa. They are leading the way in terms, you know, they set, so M-Pesa, which is the way that they pay for, you know, it's their mobile money system, is how they pay for everything. Um, and basically it revolutionized payment in, in Africa. So people don't really use banking as much as they use mobile payment. So now um, companies like uh, Wabe, Wabe, which is a, a music startup, and another one called Mdundo, they figured out that, you know, for us to be successful, we have to f use familiar uh, payment systems in order for the market to respond to what we're doing. So, you know, most of their payments, like 60% of their payments, will come from M-Pesa rather than Visa cards or, or PayPal. The options are there, but people, you know, will go to what they know in order to, to buy their ringtones and stuff like that. So for me, um, A, in terms of, of, of startup communities, Kenya is where I think the most exciting things are happening technologically. And um, yeah, that's, that's really it. You, what do you think? Um, again, I'll speak more in particular in the case of sure. Ghana. Um, Ghana is now coming, and I'm hoping that in the next years it's going to, I don't know, kind of push for, for tech. It's, it's a very connected country but it's still not a super active country in terms of startups. But there are music startups. I haven't come across any service that I thought was really groundbreaking, but I think what Fiona said is very important. A lot of it's gonna break down to how is stuff paid for and how, how, how does the payment come across? And I think something like streaming, when stuff seems free, that's a big advantage, I think. Another thing I would say, and I don't know if it really answers your question, but I see a lot of startups and I see a lot of good ideas but what I see as a user in Ghana is service that's very unreliable. So when it's difficult to make a call, probably you won't be able to stream a song. I don't know right. when, so that's, I don't know if that's gonna put a lot of pressure on the providers. Um, I don't know how it's gonna pan out, but I don't see realistically in the, in the immediate future how this kind of sophisticated service could possibly work. Yeah. That's uh, fascinating. I really know very little. I need to learn more. And Michael, for, uh, of course, Deezer has a pretty extensive uh, sort of API program, and so you work with a lot of startups as well that are using Deezer uh, tracks. And so how, how have you seen that evolve? Uh, of course, you're based here in Berlin. I don't know if you've seen anything, anything exciting recently here or elsewhere that you want to talk about. Yeah, there, there are a lot of startups that we work with. As you said, we're, um, we're having the API. We're at the hackathon tomorrow. Uh, so we're very open to that. Open with like uh, 50 startups already. Um, 
they can use us for, for the apps and just integrate the music there or integrate their services within Deezer, like 22 tracks also is integrated. Um, so, so we are very open to that. I see a lot of uh, exciting stuff also in the, in the crowdfunding area where concerts and so on um, are getting crowdfunded. Um, I also see a lot of exciting stuff around um, the... Uh, kind of the, the commerce around artists, like to see, okay, what my favorite artist is wearing, what they're drinking, which instruments yeah. they use, all these kind of e-commerce uh, around artists. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, and, and and there's a lot of, I mean, in Berlin, you can go around every corner and find another startup that's doing something exciting. So I probably would, would kill the time here to, to mention all of them, but uh, <laughs> we're very open yeah. to working with them yeah. um, and to give them the audience um, and... Uh, Great. And, and Janine, uh, from, from where you are based, you're, you're in Hamburg, right? Yeah, we're in Hamburg. And, uh, and it's interesting because it's, it's, it's the music city, right, for Germany. It's like it, in terms of industry. You think? Well, That's I don't great. know. It feels like I mean, the, cool. the industry yes, side. Yes, we are, of course. Not the industry good. side was very much Hamburg, right? Um, it, it was, and it is. I mean, the games thing is a bit bigger, I would say. Right. The games um, branch or the games market. But uh, when it comes to startup things, I, I have to change my roles a bit right now because I'm doing a startup on my own, which is cool. currently working in the field of um, having or offering a complete back office solution for labels and even smaller labels to reduce this administrative noise on their end. Yeah. So, and what I found, I can only talk about Hamburg right now and about my personal experiences is that of course we are always looking up to Berlin because I mean, there is a startup around every corner. You just, just hear a lot of success stories and Hamburg is not there yet, but there are a lot of networks, initiatives, round tables, um, private, um, regular meetings where you could go to and there is a lot happening in terms of um, yeah, networking which is pretty important because yeah. I mean um, I myself I'm right now I founded this thing alone and I'm right now in the process of finding investors which is pretty hard because it takes a lot of money for a software driven very techy kind of startup and um, it's worth a lot to know that there are roundtables you can go to and there are people who've gone through that and who can tell you, well, ask this particular party or why not call SAP or another big company? They have went venture capital funds. So um, it's really, it's evolving and it's, it's cool to have a scene which is so open to exchange ideas. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was at Social Media Week uh, yeah. in March and it was, it was really great. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's getting away from the status of being information hiders and just working in your own little garage. And um, <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to have discussions and I think the one could help the other and uh, have recommendations. And there we are again at the point of personal recommendations. And um, yeah, so I hope we are not uh, getting only the music city of Germany, but the startup city. So we are working. Hamburg <laughs> is uh, really coming. Wolf, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And uh, uh, we got like about four minutes left and I just wanted to zoom through a couple of things because I've, I've pre-recorded the opening of the show, which is terrible because things always end up being hijacked and you never end up being able to cover everything you want to cover. And so, uh, first of all, uh, Samsung rolled out a, a VidZone on devices across five major European, European countries. VidZone is a video a streaming site and essentially uh, uh, it's going to work on a variety of mobile devices, uh, smart TVs and tablets produced by Samsung so users can access to a bunch of music videos that way. So uh, they have 65,000 videos from both the major and independent labels. Uh, it, it had been uh, confined to the PlayStation, so if you're a PlayStation user, you might have seen VidZone. I'm not sure if it's available in Germany or not, uh, with 11 million downloads. And it's interesting to see another sort of UK company that, that is doing this kind of video stuff branch out to other countries. Yeah, I mean, the, I, just to comment on that, on the music sure. video side, I mean, in Germany, we saw, we saw that a lot of pure music video companies are struggling a bit. So the first had to re shut down. That's QTOM from Hamburg, our friends. Uh, so it was really, really hard to see that. Uh, so pure music video platforms sometimes are, are struggling a bit. Um, but there are also some promising things, like for example on Empire, we also have the music streaming together with, uh, with the video streams. Um, that worked well in, in a certain sense. This is why we've integrated Empire now as a, as a video app now also in Deezer. Uh, just launched this week as well. Um, and those combinations with music videos and, and other products like um, 
like for example, with my video um, and Empire, these things, I, I strongly believe they will work. But pure standalone music video propositions where you just go and, and have a pre-roll and then a music video yeah. and then another pre-roll and another music video, those will probably, um, yeah, especially Struggle. if music streaming is, is getting bigger, will probably have some um, some issues in, in funding all the operations that is necessary in terms of streaming, CDN, uh, the editorial stuff and so on. So Absolutely. Uh, no, thanks for that. And uh, finally, the last thing was uh, talking about YouTube. So YouTube uh, finally uh, rolled out uh, this uh, this sort of crowdfunding donation more like service uh, yesterday to five, uh, four territories, five territories: uh, USA, Mexico, Japan, and Australia. So the service will charge a five percent in fees, uh, plus a baseline fixed fee, which is twenty-one cents in the USA. Uh, which uh, you know, it's a donation button essentially. It's like a PayPal donation button. You can donate some money. There's no opportunity to do uh, recurring payments. Uh, you can can't ask for money for anything that's happening in the future. Uh, so it's very much a right there and then, I like this video, I want to give a little bit of money to this creator and that's about that. So I don't think it's going to compete with Kickstarter or Patreon anytime soon, but uh, if you, anybody's got a super quick, quick comment on that uh, or... Yeah, super quick comment would be that, yeah, it's nice that they did it. You have to pay per uh, Google wallet yeah. and you always have to see the bigger picture. That's my opinion. So what what will it do? It will um, collect more dat data from you to be able to offer you the right videos on YouTube, connect them perfectly with Google Plus and Google Play Music um, offers, and to be able to compl completely trace the user's behavior. So if he's interested in that or this specific crowdfunding project, what does this do to all the Google Cosmos tools which are out there? So, of yeah. course, this is the next p piece of the puzzle for the bigger picture of being or having consumer data, which is simply like an all-round setup sure. of how you are behaving in the digital sense. And on the and, Google um, systems. <laughs> on the go especially on the Google <laughs> systems, of course. And what um, can this bring for Google to drive revenues on their other services by selling products, by setting proper advertisement. So I think this is um, this, this has to be seen in the bigger context of completing the big Google strategy, Picture. which yes. we all want to know. <laughs> the circle, yeah. uh, close the circle, and uh, uh, that's it. I think uh, you know a few hours ago I got an interesting press release from Wimp, uh, who are releasing a high-quality streaming service in the UK and the US called Tidal, priced at uh, twenty dollars or twenty pounds. So I'm um, hoping to get somebody from Wimp uh, on the show next week, uh, which should be fun. And uh, that's all for this week. I would like to thank so much my panel uh, for taking part in the show. And uh, once again, let's uh, recap uh, on all your websites just so that people can find it of course uh, for michael it's uh, deezer.com and from fiona it's uh, afripop.com afripopmag.com right uh, and uh, benjamin wh what's your what's your url aquaba music.com and aquaba is not so easy to spell but google will correct it for you it's fine and i, I will i will put the links in the show notes as well when this comes out and uh, uh, janine it's uh, finetunes.com right it's finetunes.net. .net, .net yeah. of course. Sorry. Again, well, you know, at least uh, I'm, you're here to correct me, so it's good. Uh, thanks so much for coming down. It was uh, great to have you uh, here. It's uh, kind of weird doing it live because we do it via Skype in a, in a very small room usually. So uh, thanks so much for coming, and thanks for listening to the DMT uh, of this week. Uh, it comes out every week, of course. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. Also remember to check the DMT one-to-one -one show, and this week we have a great interview with uh, Smule talking about their new artist program. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. Week and until uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you.